Hey there! Mac OS Toyota Sequoia has been out for about a month, and look, you're not a stupid little baby. You've already downloaded the latest and greatest operating system. You've tried all the features. You don't need a video tutorial on how to use it. And so this will not be that. We are going to talk about some of the more advanced things, things you might have skipped over if you didn't know they were there, including many keyboard shortcuts and hotkeys that I haven't seen basically anybody talk about. Let's get into it and stop wasting time. All right, if there's any highlighting feature of Mac OS Toyota Sequoia, that is the official name, it is window tiling and window management. And basically Apple has gone, hmm, what can we do? Let's just copy everybody else. So they've copied rectangle and magnet and frankly, Microsoft Windows. You drag your window to one side of the screen, snaps to half size, you drag it to the top. And if uh, mission control doesn't get in your way, there you go, it goes full screen. And I can drag into the quarter and there we go. I get quarter sized screens. Big whoop, lot of freaking da, you already know that. All right, well, let's add a second window into the mix, okay? Let's add one to the left, add one to the right. And you'll notice that just like the olden days, I can drag this window and resize it individually. However, you'll also notice that there is this very, very, very light nipple that shows up about halfway down the page. If you go down here, you can actually resize both of these windows tiled dynamically, which is very cool. One thing that is not very cool is that I find the redrawing to be not very good. And frankly, the background to be very visually distracting because for whatever reason, Apple has added like many pixels of padding in between everything. It pisses me off. And if you like it, that's great, but I don't. So I'm going to open system settings. I'm going to go down to desktop and dock. I'm going to scroll down to windows and then I'm going to see tiled windows have margins. That's enabled by default. Turn that crap off. And there you go. It goes back to normal what you would see with another task app. And uh, yeah, it's just so much better. Uh, just when you resize, it doesn't get weird. That nipple is still there, by the way. I think it just looks much better. But if you want to keep it the other way, fine. Do it, weirdo. All right, this is still baby kitty stuff. Let's get a little bit more intense. Dragging a window from one side to the other takes quite a bit of effort. So don't use that effort and just hold down option. If you hold down option, check this out. It automatically highlights the left side or the right side of the screen. So I'm gonna open a new window, hold down option, boom, right side. Don't have to do the whole drag over, it just works, which is really pretty slick. There's another thing we can do here. If we go over to the uh, little green satellite button, we can take one window and resize it. Let's say, let's make it the uh, top half of the screen. That's something that's yeah, a little bit trickier to get when you do the drag the window into the area of the screen command you want. And so this just gives you a little bit more options. If you have multiple windows open, right now I have three, I can also fill and arrange. So check that out. Whoo, bada boom, bada bing. It'll take your active window and make it the one that is at that point in time, highlighted, right? But there are other features that are not displayed here that are hidden. Why are they hidden? I don't know, but hold down the options key again and check it out. I can now make this uh, screen into a quarter size. I can add another one here and then I can just go in here and uh, I can say, hey, quarters or thirds or whatever the heck I want. I can make anything the world is my oyster. Okay, that's pretty cool, but let's go even a little bit more intense because inside of every single app in the whole operating system, if you go to the Windows menu bar item and then you scroll down to move and resize, you will notice that many of the features that were in that little green traffic light menu are present here, including some that weren't really in that menu unless we use that option modifier key like quarters, top left, top right, top bottom, top left. Okay, same deal here. I can uh, just go into the menu and resize that way if I want, or I can memorize the hotkeys. Here's the thing about the hotkeys. I find them to be kind of confusing. So bottom and top, for example, is uh, control shift globe top or up button, which I think is kind of confusing. So if I go control shift globe up, there we go. But that is hardly intuitive. And so we are going to use something that has been around for a very long time in Mac OS, and that is keyboard shortcuts. So scroll down to keyboard inside of system preferences, then go to keyboard shortcuts. And now we're going to go to app shortcuts. What is an app shortcut? Well, you can tie a key binding or a shortcut to any single menu function in any specific app or any app system wide. If that didn't make sense, hang on with me here. If I go back to Safari, remember how I said if you go to window and then go to move and resize, you can see all of these things? Well, check this out. Quarters don't even have hotkeys set to them. Or what if I don't like the hotkeys that are on a range, for example, that option, command, control, whatever, globe, arrow, too confusing, okay? Well, what I can do in here is I can take the exact name and it's gotta be exactly the same. The case has gotta be the same. The spacing has gotta be the same. But let's say I wanna uh, make a hotkey for quarters, okay? I'm gonna make it top left. So I'm going to go in here, I'm gonna push plus, and do I want this to work in all applications? Well, yes, because this is a Windows function, but if there's a specific function in general that is in one specific app that you wanna make a hotkey for, this is another great way to do it. This is, that's a, that's a pro tip for you. But right now, all applications, I am going to do, um, I don't know, control, option, left. 
Okay, that's my keyboard shortcut. And what was the name of the thing again? If we go to window resize, top left is what it's called. So I'm going to type T-O-P-L-E-F-T. Again, case sensitive and spacing sensitive. I push done, I push done. And surely enough, if I do control option left, it is now going to go into the top corner of my screen. So you can use keyboard shortcuts to extend the window spacing beyond what macOS by default allows you to do. And that is pretty neat. Trivia time, how well do you know the anatomy of a macOS window? What's this part of the window called where my cursor is? Hmm? Boom, ba, boom, boom, boom. It's the title bar, okay? And the title bar hasn't changed in like a bajillion years. If I open up a Safari window here and uh, I double click the title bar, you'll see that it expands to full height. That's been a modality that has existed forever. And it does that in every app, except for Finder, it gets shrinky and small. I don't know why, it's weird. Uh, it gets teeny tiny like Thumbelina. Anyways, I've never really liked this modality in macOS. I've never used it. And luckily inside of Sequoia, there was a way to make it actually useful. If you go down to desktop and dock, in this first section, you'll see there's this thing that says double click a Windows title bar too, and you have the ability to select something. And I'm really liking the minimize function where once I'm done with a window, rather than hitting the little yellow traffic light button or command M, I can just double click and bon voyage, chez la vie, it goes. It's super, super handy. Okay, I'm a fan of the new iPhone mirroring system in Sequoia, but I gotta be honest, it feels very like janky and beta and 1.0. When I open up the iPhone mirroring app, every single time it asks me to authenticate. And this makes sense, right? You don't want your iPhone open up to the public, especially on a computer that has public access. But it's annoying because you have to authenticate via Touch ID, which isn't too bad, or if you have a physical keyboard on your desk via entering your password, and then it's gotta connect to the iPhone. It's just a whole song and dance. And oftentimes the iPhone will time out. If you start using your iPhone, Phone, then it stops mirroring, but then when you turn your phone off, it wants you to re-authenticate. It's a pain in the booty. So just come into iPhone mirroring and then go to settings. And there is a single setting in here that you can change. And that is require Mac login to access iPhone. You can set it to automatically authenticate. It's going to present you with a prompt. You have to enter your password once, but then once you do this, while it doesn't allow you to bypass the connecting screen, you can open up iPhone mirroring and then go, boom, connecting to iPhone 16 Pro, no password, no touch ID required. And that's great if again, you're on a Mac that is yours and yours only. That being said, there is one other side benefit, and that is that it will automatically start connecting when your Mac is locked. So if you pop your Mac's lid open or you walk up to your Mac, as you're typing your admin password, it's going to automatically start establishing a connection to your phone, which I think is fantastic. And you have much less downtime when you're like, oh yeah, I do want my phone, but it's not there and you gotta open it, yada, 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 yada. Okay, there's two other things that I really do not like about the iPhone mirroring app. One is that because this is an iPhone, it doesn't scale linearly like a window does. It can only scale at like one or two X or half size because again, it's just effectively mirroring your iPhone's display and that doesn't change in resolution. What you can do though is push command plus and that will two X all of the pixels that are being sent from your iPhone to make this a bigger window. You can also, if you're psychotic, command minus to make it half size. I guess this could be helpful on a Mac, but it's just so teeny tiny like Thumbelina. So that's one way to get around that. Yes, it's annoying because every time you do that, it moves the window all over your screen. It's just not very well thought out. and. While you can use the hotkeys I've explained to you, you can also use the view menu to do the same. Not window, but the view menu. <sighs> okay. The other thing I don't like is you cannot drag this to the top of the window here. There's always gonna be this little gap. And that's because you need access to these two little buttons up here. So I keep this down here in the bottom. What are these two little buttons? Well, you probably already figured it out. If you have a Safari window open, you can push the home bar, but you can't drag for gestures. And so you have to go up here, you can push home, you can hit this for your multitasking switcher, but there are hotkeys that allow you to do all of this more quickly. So again, if I am inside of an app, I can push command one to go home. I can push command two to open my multitasking switcher and command three to open spotlight. It's pretty slick, works really well, and I highly suggest you use hotkeys instead of the stupid little button that they put on the top of the window. Let me just put this up on the top of the screen and maybe find some magic where I can scale it to the size I want. Please, Apple, I'm not asking for much, just the world. Now, macOS Sequoia is not the only thing that's new. Clean My Mac, today's sponsor, has gotten an entire redesign. It looks fantastic and it's blazing fast. Skin. You push one button and it goes and finds a bunch of stuff to clean up, like your trash, like old caches and logs, mail attachments, all the guff that you've got on your drive. It looks for threats by scanning for malware, which is fantastic because that can happen on a Mac. It enhances performance by flushing out your memory and DNS caches. It goes into your applications folder and finds applications that have been removed but have old P lists left around everywhere. And then there's a My Clutter section that does, as it says, it finds a bunch of duplicate files, including files 
that look similar to one another but are not actually the same. This is fantastic when you have multiple different screenshots or photos that are slightly similar but different and some are lower resolution, some are higher resolution. Yeah, this does all of that. And it's just scanning right now. And then when it's done, well, we can just clean everything out in one click. I told you, less than a minute. But the power of Clean My Mac is in drilling down deeper. Here are just a couple things that I think are fabulous. The first one is that you might not know this, but every application you install from Apple has both an Intel and Apple Silicon binary. If you're on one platform or the other, well, you don't need the other half. And so Clean My Mac can just strip out the version that you don't need. So I have 558 megabytes of extra Intel binaries just sitting on my machine doing nothing that will never do anything. I can get rid of those, which is awesome. This is an excellent part too. You can update applications and not just stuff that's been installed through the App Store, but also applications that you've installed from elsewhere. You push the update button, it goes out, downloads the files, and installs them all for you without you having to, without you having to do a thing. It's fantastic. And then if you go into My Clutter, you can come in here and not just review duplicates, but also any files that you found that are similar images, that are old downloads, and are just files that are generally large, taking up a lot of space that you might have forgotten is on your system. That is the Clean My Mac app, but stuff even expands to the menu bar. You can come in here, you can run an internet speed test, you can see what uh, your memory usage is, you can free that up, you can see what your CPU load is. It's really, really well thought out. And well, I think you should get a Clean My Mac today. If you purchase it, uh, through my link in the video description, you can get a seven day free trial. It's available from Clean My Mac directly from the Mac App Store and also from Setup. You should really try it today. I think it's fabulous and I think you're gonna like it. Safari's got some new features. For one, there is a new video viewer. So when you're on a website that has video, you can play the video surely in the page as you want to, but you can also push Shift Command R and it will pull the video out. It doesn't go picture in picture. It just dims the rest of the content surrounding it. If that's distracting, centers it in the frame and kind of blacks everything else out. It's really, really nice. What you can also do if you don't want to do Shift Command R is go into video and then go to enter video viewer. That's a long list. So just Shift Command R is much easier. There is another feature inside of Safari that I think is fantastic. And it is that you can hide distracting items. Don't think of it as something that you can block out like ads, for example, because it doesn't really work on dynamic content that's always changing, but it's excellent for static content that you don't want in your way anymore. So for example, here on YouTube, I keep getting, for whatever freaking reason, news into my feed. And I always say, I don't wanna see news, but it keeps on coming back. So I can come in here and I push this little button in Safari. I go down to hide distracting items, and then I can scroll down to this section that I find to be distracting. I click to hide it, it disappears, and then I push done. And sure, it's missing on this page right now, but even if I refresh, if it tries to load that block in, it just doesn't come back out. It's fantastic. It's really great. I really like this. And then yet again, if you want to hide it again or you want to show it, we can push show and it comes right back up. So that's a great way to get rid of content that websites are pushing at you and you're just like, no, just go away. And it works for everything, not just content, but menu bars. It's fantastic. The last Safari feature that I really like is that apps that run from the dock, and you might not know about this, but if you're used to using crappy Electron apps that take tons of resources, you can just push the share icon here, and then you can go down to add to dock. And if you push add to dock, that will make an app that goes in your applications folder like any other app, but it's just a Safari web wrapper. So I've made one for twos, which is my task list. And if I open twos, you'll see that this opens up a brand new Safari window. And uh, it's quite slow to launch. That's not Safari's fault. That's the app's fault. However, what you'll notice is that I can now use my actual extensions that I'm used to using inside of Safari. That didn't used to be the case. So if you had an app um, that had ads in it or whatever, those would pop back up. You can now enable extensions and do everything that you're used to doing from within your regular browser window, but in an app that runs from the applications folder and uh, sits in your dock like any other app. It's really fantastic. Way to go, Safari. There's a couple awesome new accessibility features. Open up system settings, click accessibility, and scroll down to vocal shortcuts. Then click setup. What on earth is a vocal shortcut? Well, it allows you to enable a system prompt or a shortcut by just saying a vocal phrase. So instead of having, if I have limited motor function to change the live speech on and off, I can just come up with a phrase that enables live speech or disables it, which is pretty slick. The other thing you can do is that if there's a specific Siri request that you run with frequency, rather than having to say, for example, hey Dingo, what's the weather? You can just type weather and then it will run, or you can just say weather, and then it will run that request that you process often. 
That's pretty cool. But one thing that's even cooler is that you can run an actual shortcut. If you look at my action button on my phone, I have an action button, uh, excuse me, a shortcut that allows me to add any to-do that I want to my to-do list. It's pretty slick. And I can do the same thing on my Mac by using my voice. So I'm going to go down and find Two's New. That is the name of this shortcut that I have synced to iCloud. Now I need to come up with a unique phrase. So I'm going to call it New Task, okay? Once I push Continue, it's going to have me say that so it can learn how I say that. New Task. New Task. New Task. Okay, I push continue, there we go. And now, anywhere from wherever I am in the system, and bear with me, it's a little bit weird because I am using a screen recording software that kind of interferes with the mic, so it might take one or two times, but I can say, new task. Let's see, new task. And it runs that shortcut. And just like on my iPhone, I can add anything I want to my to-do list very, very quickly. What's great is that you can say this while you're still doing other things and it'll just pop up when it's ready, which is pretty dang slick. One other accessibility feature that I think is just bloody wonderful is uh, here inside of system settings, you go down to accessibility again, and then you go down to sound audio. <laughs> Here we go. We scroll down and it's called background sounds and it's exactly what it sounds like. I turn this on and well, nothing works right now because um, well, I'm screen recording, but typically you would hear a lovely crackling fire. <laughs> um, this is really great and there are a bunch of sounds that are very, very, very wonderful to listen to, just as like filler ambiance noise. It's like white noise effectively, so that if you can't work or write very well when you're, for example, listening to music, which I can't, I can put on some sort of ambient noise to stimulate the brain. The problem is that you used to have to come in here to do this and enable this, and it was a huge annoyance. Well, you don't have to do that anymore. Now what you can do is go into Control Center in System Settings, and then you go down to Hearing, and then you can say show in menu bar or show in control center. That's what I've done. And now from within control center, I can go down here, I can click the little ear and there you go. I can turn background sounds on and off. I can select what background sound I want and how loud or quiet I would like it to be. It's really great. And I think you should try it. You might like it. It's a fire. What's not to like about that? Let's talk privacy. There is finally a passwords app inside of Mac OS. No more keychain access, no more having to go into Safari settings inside of the settings app on the iPhone, no, no. A real app for real passwords. And frankly, while it doesn't have the feature parity that I have come to expect from one password, like custom fields and passwords of custom length, password history, it's pretty decent. And I think it will get better over time. Frankly, it's autofill functionality is perfect. And that's why I think I'm going to use it. But I really love the menu bar applet from one password and well, Passwords has one, it's just not enabled by default. So come in here, go to passwords, go to settings, and then bloop, show passwords in menu bar. And now you will get this handy little applet that once you authenticate, you can search everything. Two-factor codes, pass keys, whatever you want, it's there, ready to rumble. And you can even open the website in Safari directly from this window, which I think is very, very slick. All right, let's talk about the other uh, little privacy change that I think is very much worth enabling. If you go into Wi-Fi, and then you click details on the network that you're connected to, you can come in and determine whether or not to use a private Wi-Fi address. So there's a thing called a MAC address. It's a hardware identifier for your machine. And it's a, it gives local networks, so not the internet, but like your local internet, so the hotel's router, for example, to give them the ability to track specific devices to log activity and do all that stuff. And, and a lot of times you just don't want that. So by default in macOS for a little while now, it has created a private Wi-Fi address. Your real Mac address of your actual machine, it hasn't been showing that for a long time. <laughs> it's always defaulted to this fake one that it's made up, but it's fixed, it doesn't change. And when you're on like your home network, you probably want that because you want the ability to have a static you know, IP if you want that or to measure traffic or whatever. But if you are at a hotel or at work or somewhere else, you can move to what is called a rotating private Wi-Fi address. And all this does is it changes your MAC address as it appears to the 
Wi-Fi local area network operators uh, every two weeks uh, and or every time that you manually choose to refresh it. This makes it much trickier for hotels or for employers or whatever to track your specific devices, to see the activity that you're performing on the network and yada, yada, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's worth joining. Uh, I think it's worth enabling. It is enabled by default on uh, networks with weak security and or just wide open networks, um, but you generally don't want to use networks that are unauthenticated with a password anyway. Uh, so yeah, those are the security updates and I think they're pretty good. Let's talk about a couple of weird little remaining things. If you go into the TV app on Apple TV, yeah, we're going there, uh, and or, looks like I've never opened it on this machine, and or into Apple Music. If you go into the app's preferences, uh, you can go to playback and there is a new feature called HDMI pass-through. This is very, very cool. If you want to use Dolby Atmos as an audio format, you can now do that by using HDMI on your computer. So not only are you passing the video, but you can pass through uh, Dolby Atmos style video rather than, you know, mixed, just 5.1 multi-channel surround or stereo surround sound. That has to be enabled manually because some TVs and projectors freak out when you have HDMI pass-through enabled, but everything that's been built within the last five years should be totally fine. Turn that on and get yourself some better audio quality. It's particularly fantastic when you are using and playing back Atmos tracks from within Apple Music. That's definitely something that you wanna do if you're connected to like a receiver or whatever. Okay, couple more things. No more right clicks at the keyboard. Huh? You might be thinking? Yeah, okay. Well, you can now open up the contextual menu anytime from uh, any window by pressing control enter. So instead of having to right click, you just push control enter and then you can key down with arrow keys on your keyboard. Windows have been able to do this for like 50 bajillion years. That's new in Mac OS Sequoia. You always had to right click. Well, now you don't have to do that. Control enter and you can open up the right click menu. What else do we have here? Oh, uh, iCloud Drive. Okay, so if we go into iCloud Drive, here we go. Let's say I always want to have my text edit document uh, or folder downloaded. I can just right click this now and say, keep downloaded for whatever reason in my mind, it doesn't make sense. You have not been able to keep a file downloaded inside of iCloud Drive. Eventually, no matter what, it'll just be like, ah, you've gone two months without using this, you don't need it anymore. And then you need it and you don't have it. Well, now you can tell iCloud Drive, I do not care, do not get rid of this, keep it downloaded on my machine all the time. Last thing, go into system settings, go down to appearance, click wall, no, where is it? Go down to wallpaper. They've moved that out of there and it's very weird. There are some very cool new moving wallpapers in Sequoia. And if you haven't checked them out yet, I think you should definitely check them out, including this new dynamic one that is just absolutely delightful. It's called Macintosh and it's so, so, so cute. And this spectrum color is amazingly retro. It does this very pixelated old school, like Mac OS 7 design. And it is just so absolutely wonderful. And I think you should try it. So I'm running Sequoia 15.1. And of course that comes with a bunch of headlining features surrounding Apple intelligence. We've got writing tools, smart replies, and improved Siri, and one that I know people are going to love, this cleanup tool where you can come into photos, you go clean up, you select or draw something that you wanna get rid of, like these two little golfers, and then it just goes ahead and gets rid of them. Goodbye, see you later, c'est la vie. Yeah, those are the headlining features, but there are a couple of other features coming to Mac OS 15.1 that are not directly related to Apple Intelligence, and they're very cool. For one, there is now drag and drop support supported on iPhone mirroring. So if I come into using, remember, Command 3 to the Files app, I can find a file that is on my uh, computer here and just drag it over. That is not present in the base 15.0 version of Sequoia, but it is in the updated version. That's super slick, and I think that is fantastic. One other thing that is new that I think is really very cool is um, this better low power mode. So this is not enabled by default. You actually have to go into system settings and then go to control center, and then you go to battery. But if you go to battery, you can now show an energy mode when active or always. So um, if you've got your battery, I've got my battery hidden inside this little menu right here, but see how I go in here? It'll tell me what's using significant energy. There is a low power mode in Sequoia, but it's not enabled by default. You have to go into the battery portion of system preferences and then turn on low power mode, which is really, really dumb. So just come into control center and then go to 
where was it? Battery, and go to show energy mode always. And now, whenever you navigate to your battery panel, you can automatically turn on and off low power by the click of a button. It's fantastic. I think it's really great for when you need to extend your machine that extra mile. And boy, Apple Silicon is so efficient that I've, I've turned low battery mode on with like 10% battery left, and it lasts me like another day and a half. I mean, it really is cool. And that is all you need to know about Mac OS 15.0 on Sequoia. I hope you enjoyed watching. Uh, please subscribe, leave your comments, down below. And uh, yeah, man, new studio. We're, we're getting into it. Things will get better here over time. Thanks for your patience. And as always, stay snazzy.